I'm Marin McKenna. I'm a journalist and author and senior fellow at Emory University's Center for the Study of Human Health, which is the sponsor, along with the Georgia Center for the Book, of this series of author Q and A's, and welcome to the first iteration of this semester's series of author Q and A's with Nicola Twilley and Jeff Mayno, authors of the fantastic 2021 book Until Proven Safe: The History and Future of Quarantine, an incredibly apposite topic for right now. So. Um, uh, attendees, you, because this is a webinar structure, you can't come into the camera view to ask a question, but you are welcome to ask questions through the Q&A function, and then I'll filter them. We, all three of us can see them. And you can put a question in at any point, if, if whatever you are prompted by what we talk about, but we will get to audience questions in kind of the second half of this hour. I get to ask all the questions first as the host. So, mm -hmm. Nikki. Jeff, let, can we start with you just sort of telling our, our listeners sort of who you are and, and, and what you do in the, the rest of your life when you're not writing fantastic books? Sure, you want to go first? Oh, you can go first. Uh, well, so in the rest of my life, uh, I co-host Gastropod, which is a podcast that looks at food through the lens of science and history. Marin has, of course, been a guest. Um, and we, uh, we, I do that with uh, my co-host, Cynthia Graber. We've been doing it for a while now. Uh, our latest episode is on barrels, um, which is which is a lot of fun. Jeff had actually, in fact, been requesting an episode on barrels for about five years. So <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> he finally, 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 got, finally got it. Um, and then apart from that, I, uh, I write uh, magazine articles, usually for The New Yorker. I'm working on one at the moment um, that I can't say what it's about, but it's due on Monday. So thoughts and prayers, please. And uh, <laughs> and uh, and then I also have another book in the works, um, which is about refrigeration. Um, so uh, that will be on your shelves one day. Hmm. Jeff, how about you? And um, yeah, I'm Jeff Mayno, and uh, I'm also a writer. Uh, I'm also a Nikki's proud husband, and um, I primarily cover architecture and design. Um, I've been writing about architecture, I'd say, for nearly 17 or 18 years now, um, mostly through, um, I've got my own blog called Building Blog. That's just at a, well, I'm not even going to try to spell it. It's, a, it's an unusual spelling, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a blog online. And then I've been writing for uh, magazines and, and newspapers, New York Times and The Guardian and Wired and, and all kinds of places. And uh, I started writing fiction about five years ago as well. Um, so I've got a, a short story that was uh, under, uh, it, it was uh, optioned by Netflix and is actually now currently shooting in New Orleans. And so I should be on Netflix at some point next summer. That's and, fantastic. Uh, looking forward to that. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, yeah, and then other various things, a couple, a couple other things I'm working on now, but, um, but that's the, that's the basic gist. So um, I'm going to slot this question until way later on my list and we may not get to it, but uh, one of the things I love about both of your backgrounds and your current practice is that you do so many things that are not text-based, mm -hmm. um, that, you, you know, you're, uh, Nikki has the podcast that she and Cynthia created, is it five years now that it's been going? uh it's seven yeah I think it's oh seven. my word wow i know um, yeah um, i am sort of shocked by that <laughs> <laughs> and jeff you have this in, involvement with with television and video um and i am fascinated and how other other forms of other genres well really other forms of storytelling really can enhance one's writing so maybe we'll get to that but what we're going to start with is that they, uh, the folks listening may not understand how long it takes to do a book. But here you are with a book on quarantine as the world has endured on and off for 18 months of quarantine or more. Um, and this seems incredibly relevant, but you actually must have been working on this for quite a while. So could you talk about what the genesis of this project was and uh, how, how it came to be a book? Sure. Do you know? hey, um, well, sure. Yeah, I think um, I guess sort of two things kind of happened simultaneously. Um, I, I started getting, you know, as an architecture writer, uh, uh, was very interested in quarantine as an architectural phenomenon. But then when Nikki and I were in uh, Sydney, Australia, way back in 2009, um, for a temporary summer long teaching gig, so, so their winter actually, 
um, we went on a picnic with some local friends and it happened to be near a place that is now called Q Station. And uh, what it used to be is a quarantine station, um, but it's since been turned into a kind of spa hotel. And so initially, I think our interest really kind of came out of, you know, what happened to quarantine? You know, what, what is this thing that no longer needs to occur at this facility? Um, and, you know, how can this now just be a kind of a spa hotel for people to, to get away from the city and get away from the world? Um, if quarantine isn't important enough that it needs to happen here still, where did it go? You know, like, does it, is it still something that's important? And so we launched a kind of independent research project way back in 2009 that eventually turned into a kind of group um, exhibition at a place called Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York City, where we had um, architects, we had photographers, a game designer, a fiction writer. Set designer. Yeah, set designer who later won a MacArthur Award, um, a, an artist, obviously. Some sound artist. Oh yeah, and a sound artist. Uh, I think I said game designer already, a graphic novelist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we brought together a whole interdisciplinary team where the point was to say, what does quarantine mean in your field? So if you're a set designer, quarantine means something very spatial and very embodied that it, would, that it might not mean if you're a fiction writer where quarantine is maybe more narrative or more emotional. Uh, I'm generalizing, obviously. Um, and then in architecture, of course, if you're an architect, quarantine might mean something totally different. It might mean an exploration of details or of ceiling um, by H which I'm- HVAC. HVAC. So, yeah. you know, there's any number of different things. And we wanted to say, okay, let's take this abstract idea of quarantine, of, of keeping things medically separate and then explore it in different fields. And then I'd say around 2015 or 16 was when we decided, you know what? So much came out of that research and it still seems so important to us. Um, you know, we were really convinced that we're moving into this kind of new age of quarantine. Um, and so we pitched a book and ironically, it was actually called The Coming Quarantine because uh, we were totally convinced that, you know, there's going to be an active or, or a time of mass quarantine uh, in, in our lifetimes. We used to go around mm -hmm. saying to people, you or, and, and, uh, or someone you know will experience quarantine in their lifetime. <laughs> of course, everyone did. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so we, we uh, the official kind of start date for working on the book is 2015. But I think mm -hmm. we've been interested in the concept of quarantine for, for even longer than that. And in those first years, did, how did people out, out, outside your team, how did they react to the idea of exploring quarantine? Did, did people act as though this was a thing that was irrelevant to the modern world? I mean, I think most people thought it was a very niche interest. Mm. I think we're both <laughs> like, yeah. gen, I mean, you must run into this all the time. Um, the, we're, we're used to people thinking those, these things are niche interests. What was surprising was that even within the public health community, some people uh, did not think that quarantine was really of use anymore, particularly mass quarantine um, and, and not something that they were expecting to have to rely on mm -hmm. in the future, which, which was surprising to us because other people, um, as we you know, sort of discuss in the book, were really aware that quarantine is the only tool we have um, when there's a novel emerging pathogen and we don't have tests and cures and vaccines. Um, oftentimes quarantine is all we have to sort of mitigate the spread or, you know, these ways of reducing transmission, quarantine is a key one. And, um, and so as people were aware that a pandemic was coming, I mean, in, you know, public health experts had even given it a name, disease X, to sort of try and warn people like this, this is coming. Um, I went to a, we went to a, um, and a simulation, well, we actually went to a bunch of simulations. So these are um, events where, uh, you know, public health officials, political leaders, even business leaders will kind of role play how to respond to a pandemic. Johns Hopkins runs these major kind of pandemic simulations. And the one, the, the, the most recent one we went to in October, 2019, um, it was called event 201 because uh, the idea was sort of 200 um, novel pathogens emerge each year and the 201st will be the one with pandemic potential. Um, and, and the other thing that was sort of shocking about it was that it was a novel coronavirus that we were simulating <laughs> right off. I mean, George Gao, head of the C Chinese CDC, was at the table while we were role-playing this. Mm. So it, uh, 
we uh, like to think we were prescient, but actually that is that sort of examples shows you the extent to which public health officials did know that a, pand- a global pandemic was coming and that a novel coronavirus was a very likely suspect for that. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Just briefly, you know, the uh, event 201 has since become uh, you know, a, a source of a lot of conspiracy theories, especially in sort of conservative leaning media, you know, where, you know, if you follow certain Twitter feeds, they'll just link to event 201 and be like, they knew it was coming. Um, but but having attended it, it's, it's funny to realize just how unconspiratorial it really is. Yeah. Um, but also just two very brief things. Um, you know, when we were first researching this way back in 2009, 2010, um, one thing that I thought was quite interesting was noticing just how many people um, like my stepfather, for example, who had polio, um, you know, would remember while talking to us, you know, like, okay, quarantine is a really random thing. Why are you interested in it? And then suddenly kind of be like, wait a minute, I was quarantined, you know, and then remember that they had gone through quarantine, mm-hmm. um, which I think is a funny thing about quarantine is that it's a difficult thing to remember. And it's also something that people tend to want to forget. Um, you know, it's a very, uh, you know, boring sort of interstitial uh, liminal experience where you're, you're, you're waiting, you know, between safety and danger. You're not allowed to go out. You're not allowed it's to interact neither with people. Neither one thing nor the other. And I think it's something that people want to forget. And I think that's actually one of the reasons why historically it's, it, it seemed to be obsolete, but it really was just something that had been sort of swept under the rug. Um, and then I'm sorry, briefly, I just said there would be two quick things. The other one was that we, we went through a period while we were researching the book where um, we desperately wanted to talk to someone who had been through quarantine in a, in a, in a recent fashion. <laughs> And so we finally found someone and it felt like sitting down with, you know, with like Beyonce or something, because we had actually found a kind of quarantine celebrity. It was a doctor um, who had been quarantined after an Ebola exposure. And, uh, you know, so we sat down, we finally got him at the same table. We were there for about 45 minutes or an hour. And, uh, but it really kind of felt like, all right, great. You know, we, we have, we finally found someone who was quarantined. You could tell us what it really feels like. And then, and then, you know, seven months later, you know, uh, at one point, more than half of the world's human population was in quarantine or lockdown. And it made the idea of tracking down one person, you know, just uh, like a a sort of comical uh, remnant of our, of our research process. So I, I want to come back to that thing you just said about how quarantine is something that we want to forget that we want to, to sweep under the rug, because I found those, your descriptions of the, the crumbling plague hospitals from 14th century Italy and the, the way that um, people thought that the, the, the hospitals of COVID could possibly be, be dismantled and stored and brought back again are both really haunting. But I wanna stay for a minute with this idea of you were working on this book and then events caught up with you. And if, was there a moment, a, a, a holy crap moment where you realized that this thing that had been consuming your attention for 10 years was suddenly like in in the news being shared by the rest of the world. I mean, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and uh, an email from our editor um, <laughs> wondering where that was, that was a good moment. where the book was, yeah. <laughs> and an email emails from all the magazine editors we'd ever worked with who knew we were working on this book, wondering could we, you know, w- could they excerpt something, and <laughs> if only it had been written for them to excerpt. And, um, and so, yeah, there were, there was that initial holy crap moment. I think there were, I mean, just a couple of interesting things. One is that the experience of uh, watching COVID-19 unfold when we had done all of this research was an extremely frustrating experience because every single thing um, that, you know, we could do wrong, we did do wrong pretty much. I mean, and and all of the mistakes had been made before. So it was just sort of astonishing to have all these historical examples in our minds and have done all the research and then watch everything unfold, you know, as foretold, as it were. Um, And so that was, uh, that was a sort of frustrating experience. Another thing that was, that then was really interesting was that because we had you know, so many, um, had had so many ongoing conversations over years with people who were directly then involved in the response, you know, we would call them up and say, what is going on? And so getting that real time view inside a completely demoralized uh, CDC, for example, um, it was incredibly interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I, there were, it was, and then the other, the, I said two things, but I'm going to say three. The other thing is, even though we had been to all the simulations and, and we knew it, at, at these pandemic simulations, they always say, you're not going to get a vaccine um, before 18 months. Well, we actually got it quicker. 
but but even though I knew that I still found it very hard to be the person say believing that this would go on as long as it had you know when we went into that first summer last summer and people were thinking oh well now things are going to go back to normal it, it, we knew we knew enough to know that they wouldn't but it was really hard to also actually believe that they wouldn't so i think that was a nice reminder for me of how hard it is and and our you know public health officials we knew said the same thing even though they knew when the reports started coming out of wuhan that this had global pandemic written all over it to actually be the one to say this is going to be a global pandemic that will shut down life as we know it it's kind of, it's, it's it feels kind of you know <laughs> so um believing in how bad it's going to be um ahead of time was pretty hard so one of the things that's so extraordinary to me is that um you know you you talk about how it, early in the book about how quarantine quarantine is in a way defined by its end that what makes a quarantine a quarantine is that at some point it is over mm-hmm. um, and yet in, in a way I mean some the lockdowns in most places COVID lockdowns are over sorry Australia but mm-hmm. um, but our our sense of being confined within this disease um, is manifestly not over, even though we're no longer in our houses and it, 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 uh, or, or confined to our houses. And um, it really brought home to me that quarantine is a term that has a lot of meanings. I mean, it has actual sort of textual meaning, I guess, uh, denotative meaning, but it has a lot of connotative meanings as well of, of an, an uncertainty and, and threat that was very evocative to me. That wasn't well, yeah. a question, sorry, but you guys, that was just more of a comment than a question, but you were welcome to. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I feel, I do feel like, you know, we, we, we write about that a little bit in the book in the sense that, you know, the word quarantine, I think really inspires fear and um, unease. And I think a, a large part of that is, well, one is that it's a very exotic sounding kind of strange word. Um, people don't necessarily know where it came from. It's hard to kind of like uh, etymologically figure out when you first hear it. So it doesn't really sound like other things. Um, I think there's a reason for that. It comes from uh, in the old Venetian dialect for 40. So it refers to the 40 days of quarantine. Um, but then, you know, I think too, the, the, the notion of quarantine is, is, is so based in uncertainty and the idea of a potential threat. Um, and I think it also does this really tricky psychological kind of judo move on people because when you're in quarantine, you're the potential threat. And I feel like people aren't really used to hearing that. Um, you know, there's, there are some sociological reasons for that. I think that you know, one thing we talk about in the book is how, you know, um, 19th century European travelers, for example, were used to thinking of themselves as the kind of clean, safe, civilized ones. And then after they had been traveling abroad and tried to come back home and they got stuck in quarantine, it was a very strange, uh, almost like a mistake. You know, surely you don't mean me. You know, I, I'm the yeah. European here. You know, I, I'm just returning back to my civilized house. Um, to, but to be considered a vector, uh, to be considered a threat or a potential danger, I think really kind of throws people for a loop. And, and then there is just that idea of, you know, what do you mean I'm in quarantine? You know, who, who, who controls that? How do I get out of it? You know, do I have a right of appeal? Um, there are just so many things built into quarantine that really kind of lend it, I think, that air of, of dread. And that's something that definitely interested us and sort of brought us to the topic. But I think, speaking for myself, at least, I, I think also a lot of people like myself, you know, felt during the COVID uh, pandemic, which was this uh, realization of one's own risk, riskiness uh, and, and one's own threat to others. And I think just as well, I mean, I think what you say about the sort of the technical definition of quarantine and then the ex- sort of expanded one is is something that we constantly, um, we kind of take the time to technically de- define quarantine in the book and then use sort of the expanded version. Um, and so do most public health officials, to be honest. Um, and, you know, most agricultural quarantine is not actually quarantine at all. It's inspection, for example, and surveillance. Um, and so uh, the way that Marty Citron, who's head of the Division of Global Migration at, um, and Quarantine at the CDC, sort of explained it to us is that he thinks of quarantine measures as a sort of whole spectrum of measures designed to kind of reduce the risk of transmission. So that runs from school closures and, and shelter in place orders to actual, you know, uh, contact tracing and quarantine uh, and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, they're all essentially ways of constraining movement and thus reducing the chance of a transmission event. 
Um, and so they are all on this sort of same spectrum and just at different different kind of points of intervention. Um, but yeah, it is it, it is a, an interesting aspect. One of the things that is interesting then about that is, you know, quarantine, as Jeff said, is a sort of um, kind of unusual power in that um, you are being asked to stay home and not move about while no one knows if anything's wrong with you yet. It's mm. sort of, as we write in the book, it's one of these moments where you're essentially um, guilty until proven innocent, um, you know, dangerous until proven safe. And that's the inversion of how we would normally operate. Um, and so for that reason, you know, at the federal level, uh, there's been a lot of work to reform quarantine and make sure it's not abused. That power, which is a, a dangerous power, is not abused, but because, you know, there is this spectrum of reducing transmission. Well, then, you know, uh, a shelter in place order is not subject to the same um, kinds of uh, restrictions. It's not, you know, there isn't a sort of a, a requirement that the state demonstrate it's the least restrictive measure. There isn't a, a duty of care that is triggered. At the federal level, if you are required to quarantine, then the state uh, owes you a duty of care. It has to be able to put you somewhere, feed you. That isn't triggered when um, when a state when you know we were all asked to shelter in place, as the lines at food banks showed. So that kind of slipperiness around what is and isn't quarantine actually had real world effects for people. Hmm. I was really struck in in reading the first section of the book. Um, uh, to what to the degree to which quarantine or the impulse toward quarantine um, shapes so much of modern history, modern, mm. I guess, I mean, it may be even further back than the modern era, but that's that it was completely shocking to me to realize that the Austro-Hungarian Empire had a thousand long cordon sanitaire on its borders, 30 miles wide. Um, mm. And so, you know, from that, you, 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 you referenced, Jeff, that the, the, our, the word quarantine goes back to the, the, the heyday of the Venetian Empire. So can we think of quarantine, or, or I came away thinking of quarantine as a as sort of a nation shaping thing in, in both positive ways, asserting um, sort of superiority over other nations, and also negative ways in the way that quarantine can be used to sort of control and exclude. No, absolutely. I, I think that's a, a, a very, uh, that's an accurate assessment, I think, of, of, of quarantine's power. And I do think that, you know, there's no real uh, error, I guess, or a mistake in the idea that, you know, one of the first things that a nation might do when it is trying to establish itself is establish quarantine inspection stations as a way of firming up a border, uh, regulating uh, passage across that border, and then making sure that you can track people who may be coming in from a foreign uh, location. And we do try to show in the book, actually, that quarantine really has actually shaped national borders. Um, it has shaped the actual geometric, you know, uh, outlines of, of countries we have today. Uh, previously um, used colonial inspection points um, basically got hardened into geopolitical borders that still exist in the present moment. And then even the cordon sanitaire that you mentioned on the Austro-Hungarian border uh, between the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, um, you know, that region, you know, still has psychological financial effects on the people who live there, but even affected uh, some uh, European vampire folktales you know, we point out briefly in the book that, you know, the figure of the vampire, which is this sort of, you know, uh, it's both dead and alive. Um, it's both uh, human and not human. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it can, it can transform between animal shapes and, and the human shape, et cetera. Um, you know, it only comes out at night, blah, blah, blah. You know, there are all these things about vampires and they kind of lend itself this kind of quarantine liminal status. And it's that region that really kind of infected the European imagination. And, um, you know, uh, and even just where quarantine stations are, you know, we, we went to Malta and uh, Malta is an interesting case because uh, Malta, if you don't know it, is uh, the audience is, you know, it's a tiny island that is closer to Africa than it is to mainland Europe and, uh, and yet it's part of the European Union. And it's a very interesting and strange place, but the Brits used it as their kind of imperial um, outsourced border inspection region. So instead of building their own uh, lazaretto or quarantine facility in England, they would just make everybody stop on their way through the Western Mediterranean and go to Malta and they'd spend 40 days or however long, um, you know, going through quarantine there. Um, but so quarantine, my point is, is that it can be used for imperial reasons, it can be used for colonial reasons, it can be used to establish borders, to establish passports, to establish control over human bodies. Um, and I think it's fascinating and really kind of inspired a lot of our research that the more we looked into it, 
the, the more we found it everywhere. And it really kind of is woven into how the modern world has shaped itself. I mean, to the extent that even the United Nations can mm. trace its roots all the way back to the International Cemetery Conferences, which were these first mm. um, sort of multinational um, uh, attempts to regulate uh, movement of people in, in order to regulate the movement of disease. Mm. Um, and those sort of morphed gradually into the League of Nations and then the United Nations. So. Mm. The, the other example, of course, that is shocking is the passport. Um, the first passports, uh, you know, were health passports, which were uh, a piece of paper, you know, saying um, what you looked like and where you were coming from. And the idea was that it was something that would say, that, that would allow you to not go into quarantine. So you were coming from a safe place if you wanted to travel and and those th those which are you know were some an innovation of black death era um hmm. italian city states are uh, are now the primary document that shapes how we move around the world today hmm. so so many um there's a, a sort of entire chapter that we use the figure of this um very peculiar um hobbyist, uh, the, <laughs> a man who founded the disinfected male study circle. Um, and we sort of use that as a way, and disinfected male is male that has, um, you know, for some reason or another is suspected of having carrying disease, which male can do, in, but not in very many circumstances, but people didn't necessarily know that, and thus is treated, you know, and it sort of establishes this paper trail, a bureaucratic paper trail of where people thought was disease. And we use that to sort of frame this chapter where we try and unpick all the ways in which quarantine has shaped the world. And it, and it, was, it was surprising, um, even though that was our thesis, we were surprised. I found that chapter really charming and the fact that you had actually had sort of pictures of the like the the, the waffle irons that the people would roast their mail in to disinfect it. I mean, it was just imagining trying to open a like a roasted letter and how it would probably just like crumble in your hands. Yeah. Well, and they used it before they figured out how to um figured out how to disinfect the inside. Uh, they would just disinfect the outside and then stamp it saying, this has been disinfected on the outside. And it's Yay. like, am <laughs> I supposed that? to open it? <laughs> well, I feel like the, uh, the, the paraphrase, although I think this was accurate to the Italian original um, in one of them, it actually said, it was just such a great metaphor. It said, dirt, clean outside, dirty inside. Yeah. And, then, and then you had to decide whether or not you would open up that envelope. But um, it, was a, it was a nice phrase that could make a, make a t-shirt. So a thing that I, I wanted to talk about a little bit more, it, it, when we were discussing the resonance of quarantine a moment ago, um, you didn't say exactly these words, Jeff, but the, the, um, the, the sense I was getting is that quarantine is essentially detention without trial, right? Like it is, it is a, um, it, you are, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of pre-crime, right? Like we don't know if you're infected or not, because if you were infected, you, we should be clear, you would be isolated because isolation is the tool we use to control um, spread of the proven disease. Whereas quarantine has that uncertainty of maybe you're infected, maybe you're not. We're not sure how much of a risk you are. Um, and, and a thing that, as with sort of science fiction discussions of, of pre-crime and, and what we can, can, can suspect people of in advance of their doing anything, is that one, once you're tagged, once you're suspect, it's very hard to become not suspect. And, mm -hmm. and you explore this beautifully in the case of, of Casey Hickox, whom people may remember as the, uh, the Doctors Without Borders nurse who came back from the Ebola epidemic in 2014 and was put into quarantine by Governor Chris Christie in a tent in a parking lot outside a hospital in New Jersey in the middle of winter. Um, and, and the point that she wanted to make all along was that, that according to science, to what was known about Ebola, she was not a threat because she didn't have any of the signs or symptoms that would indicate that she was harboring an infection. That yes, she had been in the, you know, what we could call the risky zone, but she, it, it was clear that she herself was not a vector and no one wanted to listen. And, and the attitude all along was sort of, um, well, we're just doing this to be safe. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we can't be too careful, but can't be too careful could potentially suck up an awful lot of people. So I wonder yeah. if you could talk about that a bit more. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, uh, as a as a preamble to that, I would say actually uh, one of the things that was interesting about sucking up too many people would be that actually some of the things that went into the uh, sanitary conferences was actually specifically the attempt to control uh, Muslim uh, pilgrims on the Hajj every year when they would go to Mecca, and then on their return they would be quarantined, and it was a way to um, maintain their you know to track their movement, uh, to prevent them from coming back, uh, to sort of delay their return to Europe. Um, but so it was interesting that quarantine on that level also has a kind of ominous political uh, overlap with uh, the control and tracking of, of Muslim uh, citizens. But in any case, this case, you know, where people get sort of vacuumed up into something that is over ambitious, um, I'd say uh, I can maybe just kick off the story and then I can hand. Yeah. Uh, if, um, you know, one thing that just so is so interesting, and, and as you as you rightly said in the in the uh, and the question, you know, she really wasn't technically speaking even exposed to Ebola. And so there was no reason for her in the, in the medical sense of where she didn't have a torn um, PPE or she wasn't scratched by, an, a, a, yeah. you know, a needle or, or that kind of thing. And um, Ebola is not contagious before you have symptoms. So therefore, yeah. it, it's it, it really not a disease that one would necessarily need to quarantine for in the sense of, yeah. you know, you can't be spreading it unless you <laughs> have it. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, one of the things that was really interesting was that, you know, at, at the time, I mean, I distinctly remember speaking for myself, at least that, you know, Casey Hickox was presented as, uh, I mean, kind of a villain, actually, you know, she, wh why doesn't this person just go into quarantine? You know, what is wrong with this person? You know, we're talking about one of the most gruesome diseases in the world at the time, there wasn't a vaccine or, 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 or even necessarily effective treatment for it. Um, you know, why can't you just spend three weeks in, a, in, a, in, a, in quarantine and just do what they're asking, you know, uh, of you? Um, but it turns out after having interviewed her and really dived into the story and we spoke to a the judge who wrote, wrote the opinion that sort of, you know, uh, kind of cleared her at the same time that urged her to stay at home um, was just the realization that, you know, she was really fighting a good moral justified fight as well as fighting a, 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 against a lot of sexism, I think, in the sense that she was seen as this kind of uppity woman that thought she knew more than Chris Christie. She thought she knew more she than did. the political. She did, well, she did in fact know more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Forgive me. I, yeah. but, but she was presented as 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 someone who you know couldn't possibly know all that, and so you know she did a couple of really remarkable things. I mean, I think the main thing being that when she eventually sued Chris Christie, um, she, what she was after was not monetary gain. It wasn't that she wanted to you know buy a vacation home. It was she was after trying to change New Jersey quarantine rules. And so that other other nurses, for example, from Doctors Without Borders, when they came back, who don't have three weeks to spend in quarantine, um, you know, if there isn't, you need to be able to appeal some of these decisions. So, you know, if you haven't been exposed to something, if you don't have sin, uh, symptoms, um, if uh, maybe they use the wrong temperature system to determine if you have a fever, there's any number of different things that she wanted to push back on. And I think build, develop, developing kind of a bill of rights for the quarantine, I think was something that she was after and that Marty Citron at the CDC was after. And I think it was really a, a really interesting aspect of that particular case. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it's it's just the the larger kind of uh, point of of that chapter where we we talk about Casey Hickox is this idea that because quarantine is based on uncertainty, it's inherently subject to bias. You suspect hmm. someone may be a threat. Well, you could suspect that for any number of reasons. You could right. suspect it because of a legitimate medical exposure, or you could suspect it because they're Irish, or hmm. they're Italian, or they're Muslim, or um, as in the case of one of the, the least known mass quarantines of American history, because they're a woman who dares uh, live alone and work alone in the 1910s. Um, and and is thus uh, you know detained on suspicion of venereal disease. This is something called the American Plan, which is suitably Orwellian sounding and was used to detain um, thousands, potentially tens of thousands of women, um, again simply on suspicion that they might be carrying venereal disease. Well, that suspicion turned out to be they had had an argument with their boss and their boss reported them. They were seen dining alone in a restaurant. Mm. You know, that's, I mean, undoubtedly you have venereal disease if you do that. Um, so the, 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 this question of, you know, quarantine being a dangerous power is, is very, very real. I, I really like the way that you um, you document all the ways in which quarantine has kind of bled over into a, being a tool of social control, 
from, mm -hmm. as you say, um, you know, keeping down uppity women um, mm -hmm. to, to blocking the immigration of Irish and Italians to controlling um, Chinatown in the early 20th century when there was an outbreak of plague um, in San Francisco. Uh, and mysteriously, uh, it was only the Chinese businesses that were put inside the cordon, right? But white, yes. white owned businesses in the same location were allowed to slip outside it. It was yeah. the most gerrymandered yeah. cordon sanitaire there ever was. You know, it literally zigzagged around white owned businesses. Yes, incredible. So um, the, the, as, as, you're, as one's reading the book, the, the, the knowledge that we're going to get to COVID at some point kind of hangs over it for all these, these lovely and fascinating historical episodes that, that kind of introduce us to, to the reality that's coming. Um, there's this sense of sort of dread <laughs> that, that at a certain point we're going to get to, to COVID. And I wonder if, um, you know, in the experience of knowing about quarantine and yet having to live through this, was there any point when we were sort of early in the epidemic when you had kind of had the sense of, oh, I know what's coming. We, you know, we know more about this than most people, and we just don't think this is going to go well. Do you want to? No, you. you um, well, no, yeah, I do. I mean, I do feel like there was a sense of, of yeah, seeing mistakes being made again and again. Um, I think there was uh, not only from our historical research, but I think just from the general political climate in the United States over the last fifteen years or so, with birtherism and all these other kind of conspiracy theories. Um, it seemed like only a matter of time before there was going to be pushback against any acknowledgement that this is a real disease and that we should take personal responsibility to help contain it. And so I feel like I at least felt dread on that level, just because in fact, at first I was actually pleasantly surprised at how willing Americans seem to be to say, okay, we're going to stay home for a month or we're going to take our kids out of school. Um, you know, we're going to wear masks in public or do whatever it was, there seemed to be an initial uh, response to that, that was like, okay, let, we'll see what we can do. And we'll go along with this for a little bit. Um, but I think that the general breakdown in that, uh, that we see still getting worse, actually, um, you know, I think was something that was, could have been predicted, should have been predicted, and um, seemed relatively clear to me was going to come, I mean, just based on the political situation in this, in this country where, you know, COVID-19, we you know, allegedly isn't even a real disease. And then, and then, and then people started latching onto things like event 201, you know, that we had been at the events. Um, and then there was an earlier one called dark winter where they, they being the U S government um, and, and health authorities simulated a smallpox uh, outbreak in the United States. Um, you know, and then, and then when, when president Biden said something about how, you know, we better mask up or we're going to have a dark winter. Uh, people started saying that he used the phrase dark winter because it was a reference to this 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 planned pandemic from it was, co it was code for the yeah. least of you who can. <laughs> yeah. completely ridiculous conspiratorial thinking but i think that um, my point is that th that was that kind of stuff that i was mostly worried about and that, but then also we did see throughout the history of quarantine and pandemics of just misinformation and resistance i think mm -hmm. the other thing that was sort of um shocking was that and and that I think actually perhaps we hadn't anticipated and that um, COVID made really clear was that up until then you know people had considered quarantine as a um, public health intervention um, and uh, thought about all the ways that it would work and when you should use it and sort of the the cost benefit of sort of lockdowns and how quickly they should be imposed and you know um, when case you know when community transmission has gone too far to make these things useful all of these things have been thought through but the actual experience mm -hmm. um, of uh, quarantine and lockdown had not and you know we had clues of this in our research we went to a judicial uh, conference that was for all the sort of the, the you know the the state um uh, chief supreme justices. chief justices um and it, with the idea that they should know their uh quarantine laws which most of them didn't mm -hmm. um and this was uh, in may 2019 mm -hmm. we went to this and at that event, um, uh, someone from the CDC gave a presentation and said, listen, you know, quarantine uh, happens in a space. It happens to people in a, in a place over an amount of time. And it is enforced by people. Do you know, do you know, do you know for your state who will do that? Um, and, 
you know, he had, he, for example, had been working on quarantine regulations in South Carolina, where uh, state regulations say that the police will enforce quarantine. And every time he talked to a police official in, in South Carolina, they were like, well, no, sure as heck, not going to do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, and so this idea that it's, it's, it's a public health intervention, like a drug or like a vaccine, But it's very different in that it is a lived experience that has to happen over time in a place while people are still getting fed and paying their bills and their family members need something. And they have to, you know, somehow be, if not entertained, at least life made bare. All of those sort of considerate considerations for quarantine hadn't really been thought through because the people thinking it through thought of it as a public health intervention to flatten the curve and do what was needed on a on a public health level. So I think, you know, we had had some inkling of that prior to um, COVID-19. And that's why we had been so um, eager to talk to someone who had experienced quarantine and to think through sort of the psychology of this. But I think the living through COVID really made it really clear how under designed and under imagined that piece of quarantine is. Hmm. So I just want to re- remind um, attendees that now is a great time to put your questions into the Q&A box. If you have questions, there is one that I'm going to bring up that's very relevant to what we've just been talking about. But, you know, this first, this sense of like sort of who's responsible for imposing quarantine, um, because I've been writing about diseases a very long time. I, I remember covering SARS and someone who was, um, and I don't think you mentioned exactly this episode in the book, but you do mention sort of what came out of it. Um, someone who was, was uh, suspected of being infected came to the West Coast of the United States and um, I think to California and declined to be detained. Um, mm-hmm. And when the California authorities were saying, you know, we have, to take, we have to take everybody's data, we have to be sure where you're going, we have to make sure that you are not infected. And this person said, no, and, and got on, I think it was a train and went to, I think they ended up in Las Vegas. They might've driven, but I, for some reason, I remember it being a train. And the, 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 the CDC and the states looked at each other and realized that no one actually had at that point the power to, to that uh, to a quarantine power that stretched across state lines that it it had been sort of belonging to the states and out of that came that model public health act that right. you write about that that Larry Gostin of of Georgetown University's um, global health law center um, uh, wrote that now was ad- has been adopted by many many states since then okay so audience question I just can I oh yes please please. Can I say, according to that, well, one of the things, I mean, in this, in the sort of, there's a chunk of the book where we look at quarantine in different contexts. Um, and one of the things that's so astonishing is just that gap in regulatory powers and thinking through enforcement is not limited to public health. Uh, for example, um, the United States has signed on to the Outer Space Treaty, which commits us to planetary quarantine, planetary mm-hmm. protection. Um, and yet NASA is not a regulatory agency. So mm-hmm. when Elon Musk fires an unsterilized Tesla into space, everyone is just like, ee! even though we are responsible mm-hmm. for that, the, you know, the United States is. So these gaps and sort of underthought through <laughs> <laughs> um, aspects of enforcing, implementing, regulating quarantine are really sort of widespread throughout the field of quarantine. Mm. And if, in fact, also briefly too, that reminded me of when we were at a different, or no, maybe this was the judicial conference, but um, we went to a different conference where a, someone told a real story where they, I think it was an Ebola or possibly SARS, but someone had to drive, they were given permission to drive mm-hmm. from the airport like Dallas-Fort Worth um, through Texas into Oklahoma. Um, but the only way to make it feasible was that uh, it wasn't even just crossing state lines, it was crossing county lines. And so they actually had to get on the horn with individual sheriffs for individual counties and then do a kind of relay race where they would hand off this person as they drove in their own car, a rental wow. car. Um, and then when they got to the county line, the sheriff would call ahead and then another patrol car would follow and then they'd call ahead. And then eventually they went to Oklahoma and in which case they're no longer a court, you know, they're no longer even within the bounds of the Texas Board of Health. Um, but so that kind of almost Kafka-esque sort of approach to incremental control over quarantine and who who controls what, you know, who is surveilling who, 
um, it was something that I think we, we still haven't really gotten to the end of that. And this is a uniquely American yeah. problem because the, our health powers are, are very devolved, uh, mm -hmm. lower even than state level to like the local authority level, yeah, counties, um, and, sheriffs. counties yeah. and sheriffs. And so yeah. Uh, that has, I'm sure, some advantages that some people would be willing to argue for, but for pandemic control, yeah, it terrible. has always, it is a, it was, you know, foreseen as a problem and experienced as such. Exactly. Well, and the, pub, the, the, the passports and health passports that you mentioned, you know, we can't have a national yeah. health passport in the United States because we haven't got a national vaccination registry. Uh, it, it's, it's literally not possible unless we, I mean, we, I suppose we could completely reform our records, but it's not possible at this moment, which is astonishing to me. Yeah, I agree. So, oh. so Cassie asks, uh, Dr. Quave asks uh, about that experience of quarantine, um, of, of that actual liminal experience of being confined. And are, do, do, does anyone not mind it? In the sense that is it you know it's a it's a timeout it's a circuit breaker for all of life does anyone find it a sort of calming or or zen experience or is it, it, it do we know that it's sort of uniquely stressful precisely because people are removed from their lives that's such a good question um, and i think was it I'll, I'll just say a couple things one is that um uh much depends on your socioeconomic situation. Um, I mean, in general, but with regard to whether quarantine can be a, um, a, a relaxing experience or not. And that again is true historically. Uh, there are amazing um, stories from, you know, 18th century travelers in Malta who could afford it with rooms so large that they could play tennis in them. Mm. Um, and, you know, you can imagine having, I mean, still, people found something to complain about. There are, you know, uh, uh, Byron spent time in quarantine on Malta too and, and wrote a very angry poem about um, mm. how much he hated quarant his quarantine experience there. So even, even if you had a room big enough to play tennis in, it wasn't guaranteed you were gonna have a good time, but I think a lot, probably a lot more likely than for example, the sailors in quarantine who would actually have to go through their quarantine moored offshore on their ship mm -hmm. um, and, and not allowed off uh, because they couldn't afford to pay for the rooms and the food. And the, even the there were Hungarian aristocrats who had potted plants put into their um, quarantine room in Malta. So if you, if you have the money, you could certainly make it a lot nicer. Mm. Um, but do you want to talk about the, the boredom researcher? Uh, I was actually going to talk about how everyday life sort of becomes in intolerable when you have to do it. Oh, yeah. I'll show you that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, one thing that I thought was really interesting was that, uh, you know, one of the effects of the COVID-19 lockdown, I think, was a lot of people kind of abandoning their previous life and, you know, changing careers or even getting a divorce or breaking up with a partner or even moving out of the country. You know, we have friends who left Los Angeles and whose, whose marriages fell apart. And um, I think some of that actually is just that, you know, when you, when, when you take what is previously your everyday life, um, you know, whether it's a partner or whether it's uh, your Netflix subscription or whatever it might be, when you have to do it, uh, it becomes a kind of intolerable imposition. And I think that suddenly your own life seen through a different lens becomes a completely different and kind of alien experience. You know, you know, what am I doing lying on this couch watching Netflix again? Or why am I reading all of these mystery novels? Or who is this person that I'm sharing my life with? And I think that quarantine kind of made people see things in a really different way. Um, and I think, uh, which, you know, which had a, a, a huge psychological effect on people. Just so, to add to that too, um, with something in the, in the chat um, that Stefan brought up, which is um, when we actually eventually spoke to our, our quarantined doctor, Patrick La Rochelle, um, he did point out that in fact, as an introvert for him, quarantine felt a lot easier. Um, and he spoke to the Congolese nanny of his children who absolutely could not ma imagine anything um, more unbearable than separation from family mm. uh, and community for that amount of time. Whereas for him, you know, he got in shape, he read books, um, and he is, he, he said, you know, not only uh, as an introvert, but actually as an American um, with this sort of self, uh, you know, that our individualistic culture that is less woven up with family and community, again, to generalize, um, that that he that quarantine was a lot easier for him than many of the patients he worked with um, in the DRC. 
Um, I would, I just have to say, it was, we, we spoke to a boredom researcher for the book and there were just a lot of fascinating insights that came out of that because one thing that is true throughout history is that quarantine is, is boring. People just, once they get over the initial fear and the initial kind of discombobulation of being like, wait, I'm the one who might be carrying a disease? What do you mean? And the initial sort of uncertainty and sort of, well, then what if I do get sick? You know, and that kind of fear. Um, you you kind of can't be in that fever pitch forever. And when you're not in that fever pitch, that is when boredom sets in. So again, once you get to the 1800s and you have um, the start of sort of travel, at least for the elites, you start getting this documentation of how incredibly boring everyone finds quarantine. Mm. And people are writing, you know, they write letters to everyone they know. Uh, they do all their expense reports, tally up all their accounts, and then they 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 go to bed at like 8 p.m. And then, you know, it's still not tomorrow. And so th this, again, is a known sort of phenomenon. We, in the boredom researcher we spoke to said, listen, boredom is just a signal that you're not engaged in what you're doing. You don't find it meaningful. And, and to us, that sort of pointed to an opportunity because quarantine is extremely meaningful. You are making a sacrifice for your community, for the, the people around you, to keep them healthy. Um, you're part of public health, which is you know, not something you normally get to feel like you're making a difference. Um, and it, yet it's just not framed that way. And so it doesn't feel that way. Um, and you don't, you, when it's done, you don't feel a part of something larger than yourself. You feel actually more alone probably than you did to start off with. Um, and that's all wrong. Quarantine, you know, shouldn't feel that way. And I don't think it has to. It just hasn't been kind of designed as an experience, which is something we talk about in the book. Anyways, that was a long answer. So so first, thank you very much for noticing that question in the chat because I had been watching the Q&A and I had forgotten to look at the chat. So we got to Stefan. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, I have a big final question that I want to ask you. But before we go there, uh, the 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 story of the, the aristocrats having plants brought into their quarantine station reminds me that I, I wondered whether there's anything you want to say about um, about like plant and animal quarantine. Uh, you know, quarantine really kind of suffuses our lives in, in ways that we're not aware of, separate from the pandemic, that so much of what we engage with actually has been through some form of quarantine and we never think about that. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I think is so interesting, we have a sort of a chapter that looks at um, plant and animal quarantine, a chapter that looks at how we isolate nuclear waste and a chapter that looks at planetary quarantine. And I think our thought on that was, you know, you can, when you look at the logic of quarantine operating in these different contexts, you can somehow see it more clearly without the sort of the freight of human life and politics and those kinds of arguments sort of overlaid. Um, but one of the, the interesting things about animal and plant quarantine is uh, that to this, the same way that experts were warning us that a pandemic was on the way in terms of public health, uh, that threat is just as real and just as urgent in plant and animal agricultural terms. Um, and I think uh, we would do well um, having not heeded the warning about uh, public, you know, human pandemics to uh, listen to the people who are warning us about agricultural pandemics um, now while we still can. Yeah, and I think, you know, a couple of things that were, were interesting. I was going to mention it actually when we were talking about county level uh, quarantine powers. Um, one thing that came up was we went to a new um, animal disease research facility that's under construction and uh, should be opening soon in Manhattan, Kansas, which is right in the heart of American um, cattle culture, right in the heart of American agricultural production. Cows outnumber um, people two to one there. I thought it was 10 to one, actually, wasn't it? No, two to one. Oh, it was two to one? Okay. Yeah. Um, it feels, it feels like 10 to one. Two to one is not very much. Yeah. Anyway. Um, it's still a lot of cows. There's a, it's, they outnumber humans by a ratio. And uh, <laughs> significantly uh, in some manner. Yes. But uh, one of the local uh, sheriffs has actually mapped out exactly what roads he's going to block off with concrete blocks uh, in case there is a, an outbreak so that they can prevent uh, contaminated cattle from being trucked through their county um, or having disease come through in other ways. And I think that that kind of noticing local bottlenecks that you would need to shut off and place like valves or places for disease transmission 
um, you know, I think does come, it becomes a question of infrastructure, it becomes a question of geography. Um, and then in this country, at least, it's a it's a patchwork condition about about how um, local, counties are are, are designed and arranged. Yeah. But yeah, we went to a greenhouse outside London where um, cocoa plants are quarantined uh, because chocolate is a uniquely threatened uh, uh, commodity. Um, it relies on global grow growing regions, and um, you know we actually could face potentially what's called the chalk apocalypse, um, you know, which is the end of global chocolate. Uh, it's actually a feasible scenario. Um, we went to a place in um, St. Paul, Minnesota, actually, where we looked at um, wheat rust, uh, which is a yes. section of wheat plants and mm -hmm. other grasses um, and could actually lead to global famine. Um, there's an example that I still kick myself because we didn't put it in the book. Um, but, you know, one of the things with quarantine is that uh, quarantine is quite fragile. It's very vulnerable. And sometimes it's just a simple thing can make an entire system fall apart. You know, one person who does one stupid thing or a hole in the wall or whatever it might be. Um, but the facility that we visited on the campus at uh, the University of Minnesota was very close to the, to the university athletic grounds. And it's a greenhouse with this virulent pathogen that could wipe out a massive percentage of the country's wheat supply. And um, one of their fears is that actually a, uh, an overly ambitious or overly strong javelin thrower um, <gasps> is going to throw a javelin from the athletic field and it will pierce the uh, greenhouse and lead to agricultural apocalypse. Um, but I think it's those kinds of fears and those kinds of strange little vulnerabilities that are also one of the things that make quarantine such a fascinating technical challenge because you have to think about everything. If the, if the water supply goes out, if the air conditioning system breaks, um, if there's a flood, if there's a javelin thrower nearby, um, you know, you have to think about how, the, how all of this stuff will fall apart. And it's just yet another aspect that made quarantine such a fun process or such a fun thing to research and, and a fascinating topic. I was, I thought you were going to say golf balls. Maybe there's like a university so like you know, golf nice. team and they were going to whack through the glass, but javelin is, uh, javelins is even more alarming. So here's the, here's the last question that I want to ask you, you know, Nikki, a, a few minutes ago, you talked about how we don't, we don't sufficiently value people going into quarantine. We don't see it as service to the community. And so what I'd really like to hear you talk about for a minute is sort of the future of quarantine, which, which as you say in the book is something that, you know, after having been sort of denigrated and forgotten about in the first part, at least of the 20th century, um, has really, we can see in this pandemic how important it is, how much it has returned to our attention and that you, you posit that quarantine as a tool is only going to be more deployed. And yet, Jeff, you know, you rightly talked about the politicization of public health measures in the United States. Uh, and, and we can, you know, just on Monday, classes in uh, around Knoxville, Tennessee were canceled because anti-mask parents threatened to, to blockade school properties with their cars to keep kids from having to go to school under mask mandates. So what's the future of quarantine and, and, and ideally voluntary and collaborative thing in, um, in, in a country or in a world where, where public health, which quarantine is a tool of, it, it is more and more suspect and, and made politicized. How, how, what do we do? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's what we should do and then what I think we will do. Um, and those are two different things, sadly. Um, one of the things, and I think Jeff said this earlier, once we you know, emerge from a, a pandemic, no one wants to think about the pandemic, they want to move forward. In the same way we went around sort of telling people before COVID-19 happened that you are gonna experience quarantine in your lifetime. Uh, now we're, we're, we're trying to say, listen, you're gonna experience quarantine again in your lifetime. And wouldn't it be nice not to screw it up in all the same ways that we have done for centuries and we did last time? Um, but you know, the political and even just cultural willingness to look backward rather than uh, forward after a pandemic, I'm not sure it's ever been there, and I'm I don't think it's it's there right now. Um, I will say um, definitely for. Uh, Silicon Valley, uh, uh, you know, healthcare and medicine in general is a huge, huge opportunity. And I think uh, they have seen um, infectious diseases as a area that is ripe for disruption, so to speak. Um, and using kind of big data algorithmic quarantine in the book, we write about a lot of the sort of 
uh, environmental diagnostics that are being embedded in our lives. So uh, everything from your, you know, your echo or your, um, you know, your uh, smart speaker um, to your more advanced things that are currently being implemented in, in say, um, old people's homes like a Doppler radar to scan for flo uh, falls or acoustic uh, devices to test for, um, for you know, li to listen into coughs, uh, you know, uh, cameras looking at skin tone from the mirror and things like that. Uh, as these kinds of innovations uh, become sort of you know, these kinds of sensors become embedded in the spaces we live in, um, it does seem entirely possible that uh, quarantine decisions will be being made on the sort of aggregate of that data, mm. um, sort of flagging you as suspicious. And uh, the issue, obviously, is that the, um, the companies who own that data, their uh, goal is not public health. Um, so why should we expect them to use that data for the goals of public health um, when their goal is profit? Um, mm. That is literally what they are set up to do um, and what they owe their shareholders. So uh, I think thinking about that now rather than thinking like Silicon Valley is going to offer us some, some really great technology that is going to help us quarantine better in the future, um, Sure, maybe, but let's uh, have a discussion now about how that data is going to be used, shared, um, and who is going to be, you know, making those decisions and enforcing those decisions, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's all really important. And I think, uh, I guess, in addition, I'd say that maybe just going back to that fundamental question of redefining and reframing quarantine so that we see it differently. I mean, I think it's... It's, it's, it's something that maybe exceeds the topic of quarantine alone, but it never ceases to amaze me the sort of strange irony that, um, you know, when I was growing up in the 1980s at the risk of really revealing my age, um, you know, there was a particular political party that was associated with, you know, sacrifice, you know, put country before self, uh, personal responsibility. Um, that exact political party now has the exact opposite message, which is that if you were to put country over self in terms of quarantine or public health, um, you know, it's seen as some sort of communist plot um, you know, the idea that you would be personal, take personal responsibility, you might wear a mask or you might, uh, you know, uh, keep your kids out of school because you don't want to pass a, you know, a disease from one, one child to the next or one family to the next um, is seen as a kind of uh, unacceptable encroachment on American freedom and, and, and sort of individual liberty. Um, and there's just something so perverse and strange about that and so politically ironic that I think that that, again, exceeds only the topic of quarantine. Um, but nevertheless, I think presents that we have a very huge problem in this country in terms of um, political communication and um, making sure it's clear what people are being asked to do and why they're being asked to do it. You know, there's a difference between totalitarianism and um, asking you to, you know, help out your neighbor. Um, and I think that if we can uh, make steps toward redefining quarantine so that it is seen as something that isn't uh, an authoritarian takeover of individual life, I think that that would go a long way to helping shape the future of quarantine. Um, but I do think actually just to piggyback briefly on Nikki, I think that Silicon Valley um, and big data companies really are going to are actively redefining quarantine and and what I would call surveillance healthcare as we speak. And what I think we're probably going to do is that we're going to look down 10 years from now and realize that the ground has totally changed beneath our feet. And we now live in a world full of sensors and, and sort of always on uh, uh, quarantine capabilities. And if we don't have these moral, ethical, and political conversations now, um, that world will be very, very difficult to navigate. And, and that's all the more reason why it's important to have these conversations about quarantine today. So just the, these final remarks that you've left us with just really underline once again what a rich and complex and surprising and unexpected topic quarantine was. And it's why your book is so fantastic. So thank you for talking to us about it. Um, everyone, um, I am putting the link uh, to the site for the book in the chat. Um, it's a marvelous book, Until Proven Safe, The History and Future of Quarantine by Jeff Mayno and Nicola Twilley, out from Farrar, Strauss and Giroux, their uh, imprint MCD. Um, I'm so grateful that you came to talk to us about this. Thank you so, so much. Um, uh, I, I appreciate it. Um, Emory University's Center for the Study of Human Health appreciates it and the Georgia Center for the Book appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thank you all for attending tonight. Thank you thank for you, having us. Thank you. Yeah, and thank everyone as well. Yeah.